Good day. Well, all the television pictures, all the media attention yesterday was focused upon the speech of the President of the United States, Joseph Biden, to the American people following the end of the war in Afghanistan and the end of the evacuation from there, and also to the pictures from Kabul where the Taliban have been celebrating their victory. And there's been much discussion and commentary about this and also much discussion and commentary about the vast number of amount of equipment that the United States left behind it at, at Kabul airport. I would say that we can be absolutely sure that over the next couple of days and weeks, the other great powers, China and Russia, and quite possibly Iran also, will be making big offers to the Taliban, offering the Taliban large sums of money to access this equipment in order to get an idea of, some of, of how some of it works. Anyway, I think we can perhaps over-focus and over-concentrate on these TV pictures. They make a, a, a gripping and compelling television, but of course they're not part of the real work of international diplomacy and of international relations. That, though, that continues exactly as before, and the overarching story there, as I have discussed at the moment, uh, and in previous programs, is the great conflict that is now emerging between the two great power blocks, the United States and its allies in the so-called collective West, and the Chinese and the Russians and the Eurasian bloc, which is now emerging. And the place where these two great power blocks meet and confront each other on a regular basis indeed almost a weekly basis and sometimes in moments of particular international tension on a daily basis is the Security Council of the United Nations in New York. Now there's a great deal of misunderstanding and mystification about the UN Security Council and I'd like to explain briefly what it does. Every so often it passes resolutions which are binding on UN member states and those resolutions form the core part, together with the uh, United Nations Charter, of international law. But the number of times that the UN Security Council passes resolutions like that in any one year is relatively small. It does churn out resolutions on all sorts of other matters on a fairly regular basis, but most of those resolutions, the vast majority of them, are non-binding and they are essentially declaratory. But passing resolutions is only part of what the UN Security Council does. Briefly, the Security Council is the cockpit of international diplomacy. It is there where the diplomats of the great powers, Russia, China, the United States, uh, India, when it's uh, um, on the Security Council, as it currently is, by the way, Britain, uh, Britain and France also, uh, face off against each other on a regular basis and communicate with each other on a regular basis. It is there in the Security Council and in the offices of the United Nations in New York, where the ambassadors of the great powers conduct most of the negotiations which take place between the great powers and where they interact on a regular basis with the ambassadors of the other member states of the United Nations who, taken together, form the international community. So, if you will, that is where the great part, the greater part of international negotiations between the two power blocks take place. And of course, the Security Council also serves as a sounding block where the great powers can articulate their views, rally their support, make known their policies and condemn the other side. 
And if we have every so often, every couple of months or so, but regularly every year, a dramatic moment when the Security Council meets, where the great powers are in conflict with each other and where each side uh, makes speeches condemning the other and setting out its positions. So the Security Council is a very interesting place to uh, uh, monitor and to see and to observe. And what goes on there does matter because it gives one a very good feeling of how international diplomacy is progressing and how international relations are progressing and how the diplomatic battle between the great powers is working itself out. Now, it's important to say that the United States and its allies have a structural majority on the United Nations Security Council. This is partly a legacy of the period when the Security Council and the United Nations were set up in the 1940s. At that time, the great powers was the United States, Britain and France. And of course, Europe was in those days still very much the centre of the global community, with most of the rest of the world um, controlled by the various European colonial empires. In addition, there, was, there were the other two great powers, the Soviet Union and China, which, of course, remain still the Soviet Union, of course, being today replaced by Russia. But it is that 1940s international geometry which the United Nations Security Council still reflects because all attempts to reform the United Nations Security Council up to now have failed. The result is that the West, the collective West, is heavily overrepresented. Over -represented. So out of the 15 member states who sit on the United Nations Security Council, three are Western NATO member states, the United States, France and Britain, who are permanent member states. And of course, amongst the non-permanent members, you always have an over-representation of NATO countries. In this case, Estonia, Norway and Ireland. So that already gives out of 15 member states, the United States and its allies, six guaranteed votes. Now, that's important because for a UN resolution to pass, it needs nine votes and, uh, uh, and of course, no vetoes. And already one can see that the United States and its allies controlling six of those votes only need one more to prevent a resolution being passed without the need for them to exercise a veto. And they are nearly always able to find amongst the other remaining uh, states, some states which will support them. If you look at the membership of the Security Council today, you see there countries like Kenya and the St. Vincent and the Grenadines, which can reliably be counted upon to support the United States on any significant and important issue and which therefore gives the United States on the Security Council a structural majority. Anyway, enough of that introduction. What happened at the Security Council yesterday? Well, the topic that was discussed was Afghanistan and we learn from the United Nations uh, um, press office that a resolution, a resolution uh, 2593 of 2021 was passed, but remarkably and very interestingly, the United Nations press office has held back its text. What we have to, uh, what we know about the text of this resolution we get from uh, various news agencies, and perhaps the simplest and most clear-cut count of this resolution has been provided by the Chinese news agency Xinhua, and it, it uh, describes it in this way. 
Resolution 2593 demands that Afghan territory not be used to threaten or attack any country or to shelter or train terrorists or to plan or finance terrorist acts. It reiterates the importance of combating terrorism in Afghanistan and notes the Taliban's relevant commitments. Now, uh, I, I would emphasize that the key line there is notes. The resolution, which is adopted with 13 votes in favor and two abstentions, calls for strengthened efforts to provide humanitarian assistance to Afghanistan. It calls on all parties to allow full, safe and unhindered access to, for the United Nations, its specialised agencies and implementing partners, and all humanitarian actors engaged in humanitarian relief activity to ensure that humanitarian assistance reaches all those in need. It calls on all donors and international humanitarian actors to provide humanitarian assistance to Afghanistan and major Afghan refugee hosting countries and underlines that all parties must respect their obligations under international humanitarian law in all circumstances, including those re related to the protection of civilians. So all that sounds extremely uncontroversial. And yet we learn from Xinhua that two countries refused to vote for this resolution. And when we go to the United Nations press office, we learn that those two countries were China and Russia. The other 13 countries voted for it. And we also learn that the resolution was jointly proposed by the United States, Britain and France. In other words, we are dealing here with a Western-inspired resolution, but one which the Russians and the Chinese refused to support. They were not going to veto it because it is so uncontroversial in its language, but they were clearly very dissatisfied with it and so dissatisfied with it that they declined to support it. And what we learn from the United from the United Nations Press Office, or to be more specifically from the readout that the United Nations Press Office has provided, is that the, re the reason why the Russian and Chinese ambassadors, uh, the reasons they gave for refusing to support this resolution. And we start with the representative of the Russian Federation, Mr. Nebenzia, who, by the way, is a very formidable uh, uh, diplomat and personality, one who takes no prisoners and who sets out the position of his country in UN Security Council debates in the strongest terms. Anyway, here is what the readout of, uh, that the UN press office has provided says with his comments. The representative of the Russian Federation condemned the terrorist attacks at the Kabul airport and said that his country abstained from the vote because the authors of the draft ignored his delegation's concerns, referring to their refusal to add an additional passage on terrorism and their reluctance to acknowledge the terrorist threats of other groups instead separating in them into ours and theirs. The draft also did not acknowledge the negative impacts of evacuating valuable economists and other skilled individuals who will be important for the rebuilding of Afghanistan. Moreover, there was no reference to the harmful influence of freezing economic assets in Afghanistan and the neg negative impact that it has on the people re remaining there. Had there been more time, the result of the vote may have been different. However, his delegation viewed the text as an effort to shift the blame from the 20 years of failed presence in Afghanistan to the Taliban and not the countries that occupied Afghanistan 
for so long. So that's the Russian comment. And now we see the Chinese, what the Chinese ambassador had to say. And his comments were more measured, but were essentially the same. The representative of China said that given the fragile situation in Afghanistan, any actions taken by the UN Security Council should help ease rather than intensify tensions in the conflict. The authors of the draft only circulated it on 27th August and China had doubts about the urgency to pass the resolution and the balance of its contents. Unfortunately, its amendments were not fully adopted. The recent chaos in Afghanistan is a direct result of the hasty withdrawal of troops there and now should be a time of reflection. Relevant countries should change their hegemonic practice of imposing sanctions and using force at every turn. Furthermore, those countries should not claim to support social and economic development whilst seizing Afghans' overseas assets. Criminal activities by the United States and Australia in the killing of innocent civilians should not be ignored either. To achieve fundamental changes, it is vital to work with the Taliban and provide them with guidance in order to help maintain stability. Condemning the terrorist attack in Kabul, he said it demonstrates the occupation of the country over the last 20 years did nothing to eliminate such groups. On the issue of counter-terrorism, there must be a balanced approach. So that's what the Russian and the Chinese ambassadors said about this resolution at the Security Council session on Monday. And we learn a number of interesting things. Firstly, this resolution was sprung on the Security Council on the 27th of August. In other words, just a few days ago. And the Chinese and the Russians objected and said that they had lots of things that they wanted to discuss to this resolution. But the Americans and the British and the French insisted on putting it to the vote as soon as possible. Moreover, one gets the sense that there was a great deal of discussion and negotiation going on behind the scenes. And we now learn and understand a little better the purposes of Antony Blinken's telephone conversation with Wang Yi on the 29th of August, which is was the topic of a programme I did on this channel just a few days ago. It's clear that Blinken was trying to get the Chinese to support this resolution and that Wang Yi completely and categorically refused. And we also get the sense from the very heated exchange which took place between Wang Yi and Blinken that there was some kind of negotiation going on between the Americans and the Chinese and presumably also between the Americans and the Russians. And I'm going to make a guess as to what this was. I suspect that the resolution, as it was eventually adopted, did not take the form that the Americans and the British and the French initially intended. I said at the start of this programme that there are different sorts of UN resolutions, those which are binding and those which are not, and it is clear that this is a non-binding resolution. In other words, it is a purely declaratory one. In fact, I suspect that is the reason why this resolution has not yet been published, because its authors wanted to make it a binding resolution and were keen to impose conditions upon the Taliban backed by international law which the Chinese and the Russians refused to agree to unless the authors of the resolution, namely Britain, France and the United States, were prepared to make certain counter-concessions to the Chinese and the Russians, which would, as the Chinese ambassador says, have balanced out the resolution. 
And both the Russians and the Chinese make clear what was for them the key sticking points. The first was that they clearly wanted reference to be made not just to the terrorist organisations like IS the, the, uh, and Al-Qaeda that the United States, Britain and France are unhappy with, but also other terrorist uh, uh, organisations, specifically those that the Chinese and the Russians, especially the Chinese, see as threatening uh, uh, the Chinese in Western China. I'm going to be very careful again about what I say here, because as we all know, there are restrictions on what I'm able to say um, on, plat on this platform about the situation in Western China, which I'm going to abide by. But anyway, there was undoubtedly an argument about that. But the biggest argument of all was about sanctions. And the United States is, as we know, in the process of freezing uh, Afghan, uh, the Afghan Central Bank's reserves. And the Russians and the Chinese strongly criticise this and have clearly said to the Americans that they will not support any resolution uh, that the Americans propose on Afghanistan unless that freeze, that block on the Afghan Central Bank's reserves is lifted and unless the United States pledges that it will not impose unilateral sanctions on Afghanistan. And the Americans clearly categorically refused to agree to that, whereas the Chinese and the Russians made it very clear that they were not prepared to support a resolution from the United Nations Security Council unless that freeze on those assets was lifted. And I suspect it went beyond that because, of course, in the run up to the vote in the Security Council, which produced this resolution, we were getting reports that the French in particular were proposing the setting up of some kind of safe zone for um, civilians, for refugees, for uh, American citizens and Western citizens, and also for people who were wanting to flee Afghanistan. They wanted a safe zone in Kabul itself. The Taliban opposed this, and it's clear that this was unacceptable to the Chinese and the Russians. I say that because I have no doubt that this was proposed to the Chinese and the Russians over the course of the discussion for, uh, uh, of this resolution. And this resolution contains, contains no reference to this safe zone. So we have a resolution from the Security Council, which is purely declaratory. It urges the Taliban to abide by its commitments, not to allow terrorism and terrorist groups to establish themselves in the country. And it speaks about the need to evacuate refugees from the country and about the need for unimpeded access by the United Nations and in humanitarian agencies in Afghanistan. But the United States, Britain and France were unable to get the Russians and the Chinese to agree to convert this rather um, empty resolution into a binding one with strict conditions imposed upon the Taliban and with the threat of UN sanctions if the Taliban did not abide by those commitments. But the Chinese and the Russians in return were unable to get the United States to agree to lift its freeze of the uh, assets, the uh, reserves in the Afghan Central Bank. And for that reason, they refused to vote for this resolution. So, in effect, we got a stalemate in the Security Council. Neither side got what, it's, what it wanted. The Americans got a resolution of a sort, pushed through the Security Council, but it doesn't really mean anything. It doesn't bind the, Af the Taliban to anything. It doesn't impose legal commitments on the Taliban. And 
it also uh, doesn't provide any mechanism for future sanctions to be imposed by the Security Council on the Taliban if they don't comply with its commitments. And any ideas of setting up safe zones in Kabul have been completely and categorically rejected by the Taliban, by the Chinese and by the Russians. The Chinese and the Russians, for their part, failed to get the Americans to agree to lift the block on the reserves held in the Afghan Central Bank. And they also failed to get the Americans to agree to uh, uh, designating the organization which the Chinese see as destabilizing Western China, declared a terrorist organization with a resolution, this resolution, obliging the Taliban to prohibit the activities of that organization in Afghanistan. So we've ended up with a toothless resolution which gives neither of the two power blocks what they want. The United States has a structural majority in the Security Council, so it was able to get a resolution of a sort passed. Most of the countries, apart from what well, all the countries, apart from Russia and China, voted for it because none of them wanted to be seen to oppose a resolution which would ensure humanitarian access and the escape of people from Afghanistan. But it's striking that if one goes again to the press office provided by the United Nations, the, sorry, the readout provided by the press office of the United Nations, it's striking that nearly all the countries uh, uh, failed to say anything of significance. Their ambassadors were silent during the debate. They voted on the resolution without actually saying anything about it, why they supported it, what their reasons of voting for it were. So they weren't prepared to vote for it, but they did so without saying things that might have annoyed the Russians or the Chinese. In other words, they also stayed on the fence. So here we are. What we see from this once more, is the United Nations Security Council acting, as I said, as the cockpit of international diplomacy. The United States unable to get a binding resolution on Afghanistan through. The Chinese and the Russians unable to get the United States to lift its asset freezes and its, san and its sanctions threats. A stalemate, if you will. But in and of itself, perhaps... That's not so important. The other thing that is important about this debate is that the Chinese and the Russians have now, in front of the entire international community, staked out their positions on Afghanistan. And we see what the Chinese in particular are saying. They're saying that the uh, important thing at the moment is to try to stabilise the situation in Afghanistan. And what that has to involve is working with the Taliban in order to stabilise the situation. Chinese uh, ambassador set it out clearly. It is vital to work with the Taliban and provide them with guidance in order to help maintain stability. In other words, the Chinese and the Russians are at this moment in time not only working with the Taliban to try to stabilize the situation in Afghanistan itself, but they're doing something else, which is that they are acting as the Taliban's advocates on the UN Security Council. They're going to be able to tell the Taliban after this debate, look, we argued your case in the UN Security Council and we blocked an American and Western effort to get a binding resolution 
one which would insist it created a safe zone in Kabul itself and one which might have led opened the way for future sanctions upon your country. We are in effect shielding you in the Security Council from the pressure that the United States and its allies are trying to exert there. And in return, obviously, we want you to take steps to stabilize the country by working with us. We do not want to see terrorist groups establish themselves there. We do not want you to become a haven for such terrorist groups. We want to see an end to drugs production and we don't want to see massive migrant flows. And the Russian ambassador even talked about the importance of keeping skilled people, people who carry out, you know, economists and technicians and technocrats, valuable economists and skilled individuals important to rebuilding the country. The Russians and the Chinese say that they want to persuade those people to stay in Afghanistan in order to assist in the process of reconstruction. So we see how things are working out. The Chinese and the Russians are shielding Afghanistan, or shall we say Taliban-led Afghanistan, from threats of sanctions in the UN Security Council. They are starting to work towards a position where Afghanistan gradually becomes, for them, a partner country, one that they will speak up for in the Security Council, one which they will shield, one which potentially they will support, support not just at the Security Council, but also potentially through economic and, um, uh, and diplomatic help. Well, this is these early days, very early days, and perhaps we shouldn't read too much into this one debate um, in the Security Council or to this particular resolution. If we look forward to the future, a great deal, as I have repeatedly said, will depend on what the Taliban itself does. They're supposed to be announcing a new government shortly, we will sh see what the makeup of this government is and we will see how it goes about governing the country and what steps it takes within Afghanistan itself. But at the Security Council, the Chinese and the Russians have highlighted to the Taliban that far from being isolated as they were in the 1990s, they potentially have friends now. They have not just friends like Saudi Arabia and Pakistan. They have powerful friends, friends like Russia and China. It is conditional upon their behavior what happens next. But if they play their cards carefully and well and let the Russians and the Chinese mentor them, then they could take their place eventually as a full member of the international community, whether the United States and its allies like the fact or not. To what extent the Taliban understand all of this, to what extent they really grasp the significance of what goes on in the Security Council, to what extent they understand that if the Security Council does pass a sanctions resolution against Afghanistan, a binding sanctions resolution on Af against Afghanistan. It is binding on all member states, including countries like Pakistan and Saudi Arabia, which up to now have been friends of the Taliban. To what extent the Taliban grasp and understand this is unknown and at the moment unknowable. I get the sense that some senior Taliban officials do understand it, but perhaps not all of them. However, if they do understand it, if they come to understand it, and we can be sure that the Russian and Chinese diplomats on the ground in Kabul are explaining it all to them, 
then possibly, just possibly, they will understand both what the Russians and the Chinese are doing in New York and to the long-term opportunities this opens up for them. But we will see. A great deal, as I have repeatedly said in, this pro in, in these programmes, depends ultimately on the Taliban themselves, on their understanding of the, of the wider world, and on their skill in conducting international diplomacy and in binding Afghanistan together. They have shown themselves to be enormously successful in waging war against the United States, in uniting a critical mass of the people of the Afghanistan in a res national resistance movement, which they have, which the Taliban have led, and which has won this extraordinary victory against the United States. But winning the peace is sometimes even more challenging and even more demanding. And my guess is that this is going to be an even greater test for them than their military and resistance skills. But they do have friends, they do have counsellors, they do have sophisticated and powerful countries like China and Russia there to guide them. We will see whether they follow that advice. Thank you for joining me for this programme today. I look forward to you joining me in future programmes on this channel and also on our main channel, The Duran. Please also look up Alex's channel. You will find uh, Alex Christophorou's channel also. you find links under this video. And please remember also to go to our other platforms. Um, we've had lots of problems recently with PayPal, of which you are all familiar. They cut us off abruptly and without explanation. And this has made us extremely concerned about our future. But we've had a tremendous rush of support from all of you, especially on our Locals platform, um, which you'll find a link to under this video, and where you can come and support us and join our thriving community there. But also, you can find us on our various other platforms too, on BitChute, on Library, on Odyssey, and on Rumble, and of course, on the exceptional new free speech platform, SuperU. Also, please, if you want to support us, you can still do so via Patreon and Subscribestar, and by coming to our shop and buying the amazing things you will find there. Our magic mugs, our hats, our hoodies, our, sticker, uh, uh, our, our sweatshirts, our t-shirts, and all the rest. And thank you again for joining me for this program today. If you've liked this video, please remember to press the like button um, to this video and please also check your subscription to this channel. And as I said, join us on our other platforms, locals where we have a thriving community and our other platforms too. And thank you for joining me again today and I look forward to you joining me again shortly and have a wonderful day.